All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the webinar of the day, which is uh, volume one of what we're going to be calling our Ask an Expert series. And uh, today's expert is Tim Veer, Senior System Support Engineer, uh, who's uh, a longtime Sure Associate. Tim, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Yeah, great to have you here. Just for a way of background and for people who signed up for this not knowing who you are but uh, wanting to sign up anyway, uh, you've been with Sure for how many years now? Uh, let's say 32. 32. That's a good number. I like that. Great. <laughs> Started yes. when I was three. <laughs> So, yes, T Tim and I have been working together a long time here doing many training events of various different um, kinds and types throughout, uh, throughout the years. And uh, we, uh, we've quite, uh, acquired quite a bit of knowledge on various topics here. So we will, um, we will get to as many of those questions as we can today. So I did have some questions submitted in advance. We'll take a few of those. And then I will ask you to use the questions pane in the webinar window to submit your questions. There's a little um, icon that looks like a question mark. And if you click on that, uh, it will allow you to type in a question. So rather than having open uh, audio for all the questions, we'll try Try to control the chaos a little bit by having the questions submitted via that that little um, question area there. If you can't see that for some reason, or the window's not totally exposed, if you look up at the top, you have a little um, orange arrow that you can uh, either use to either expand or condense the the GoToWebinar control panel window. So you can use that to to bring that in and out. So in order to be able to access that. Uh, I will I will preface things by saying that it's unlikely we'll be able to get to everyone's question today, and I apologize uh, profusely that we can't. But uh, we do have to try try and keep this to an hour, so we'll get to as as many questions as we can. Um, and actually, I'm I'm going to start with one. I'm going to take one first here because I think I can get it out of the way quickly. Which is we we had several people who uh, in advance um, asked us to asked us about what's going on with the uh, the auctions, the FCC spectrum stuff, et cetera, et cetera, which, of course, is an, is an ongoing topic, and we could easily spend spend hours just on that question alone. But as it turns out, we actually did do a webinar just a few months ago updating everyone on what is the latest with that. So I would encourage you to go actually take a look at that. If you go to sure.com slash training, you can uh, search all of our past webinars there, and the, and the one on, uh, on the spectrum update would be a good one to go to to look at. And, and get your get your questions answered in that regard. So uh, again, feel free to, to go ahead and, uh, and and take a look at that when you when you get a chance. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I think we're going to start with some questions here. So uh, and I'm going to start with uh, one in advance to give you guys some time to to type in your questions. So we'll start with this one. It's a good place to start because I have a feeling we're going to be talking a lot about wireless today. There tends to be a lot of questions about that. And this one. A little bit of a technology question here. It says, I was wondering, how are wireless microphone signals compressed and transmitted, and have the methods evolved much over the last 30 years? Uh, various ways, and yes, they've evolved quite a lot. Uh, principal uh, evolution is from analog to digital transmission, but I'll uh, kind of uh, record the analog uh, domain first. Uh, we're talking primarily about FM transmission in uh, analog wireless, and there are some inherent limitations of FM transmission, uh, partly technical but mostly regulatory. And uh, one of the uh, limitations of those uh, regulations is limited dynamic range for an FM transmission. Uh, and the way that that is typically uh, handled uh, is to use a so-called companding circuit in an FM analog wireless system, where the audio is compressed in the transmitter side, typically by a ratio of 2 to 1 or possibly greater. Uh, that compressed audio is transmitted through the FCC allowable dynamic range window, which is 50 or 60 dB. And then in the receiver, there's a complementary expansion circuit that restores the original dynamic range. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is a technique called pre-emphasis and de-emphasis, which boosts the high-frequency uh, response of the signal in the transmitter, uh, transmits it through the FM uh, process, and then in the receiver, there's a complementary de-emphasis uh, or rolling off of that high-frequency boost. Uh, and that is to reduce high-frequency noise 
that is inherently added by the FM process. For those of you who are old enough to remember analog magnetic tape recording. Uh, Wait, what's that? No, sorry. Yes, yes well. I, I know. <laughs> the same limitations uh, were sort of inherent in analog magnetic tape recording. The dynamic range limitation had to do with tape saturation. And the uh, high frequency noise problem was tape hiss. And both of those uh, limitations were handled uh, previous to FM transmission to some extent, but developed later on. And the processes are the same. Uh, if you remember Dolby or DBX noise reduction schemes, they used uh, compression and expansion in the record process to uh, expand the dynamic range of the system. So all of that was well uh, implemented over the years. Uh, there are very high quality analog FM wireless systems that have been around for many years now. But a big difference came when we went to digital transmission. Uh, but uh, some similar limitations, again, more by regulatory uh, agencies than by uh, technology. And the principal one is in order to limit the occupied bandwidth, uh, the radio bandwidth of the signal, uh, there is an inherent limitation in the bit rate that can be transmitted at UHF frequencies, for example. Uh, and uh, the two ways that we can uh, mitigate that limitation are using symbol coding rather than direct uh, bit uh, transmission. So rather than tra transmit one bit per uh, clock cycle, we transmit one symbol per clock cycle. And symbols can have uh, two or three or perhaps even four bits per symbol. So that reduces the required bandwidth uh, considerably. Uh, however, uh, if you're looking at this illustration, uh, which shows a, a four-value symbol, uh, which is two bits, each position on the phase wheel are, uh, are defined by two bits, uh, that's a relatively easy way to transmit things and cuts the required bandwidth in half. There are uh, eight-valued symbols, uh, eight PSK, which are three bits per symbol, and you could have higher uh, orders, but uh, because of... Uh, limitations in the transmission process as far as multipath uh, interference and so forth, it becomes impractical to have very high symbol coding uh, and still have a uh, robust signal. Uh, the error rate creeps up and the signal becomes unreliable. So inevitably for most real world uh, digital transmission, we have to employ some amount of data compression. Uh, and so uh, that's accomplished by a, a process called a codec, where there's some encoding in the transmit side, some decoding in the receive side. But these are not uh, compression in the sense of an analog signal where I'm compressing the dynamic range of the actual audio, but rather uh, I'm compressing the digital bit stream to some extent and then expanding it back in the receiver. So. Uh, that is the current uh, state of signal compression, if you will, and transmission, but it's inherently different in the digital domain uh, than in the analog domain because we're not processing the signal directly in the digital domain. And just a follow-up question to that, what, what's, I mean, why digital? Like, I mean, what are the, what's the uh, point? <laughs> why would we do this? Well, um, it turns out that uh, one of the principal advantages of digital transmission is that we end up uh, being able to achieve much greater spectral efficiency. Uh, in the best analog systems that are presently uh, available, the maximum number of simultaneous uh, frequencies that you could transmit in one open television channel might be uh, eight or nine or 10 maybe if you really push it. Uh, but with digital transmission, uh, it's possible to put uh, 15, 16, 17 transmissions into a single open television channel. Uh, and under certain uh, conditions, uh, you can probably quadruple that number of channels in that much spectrum. So a uh, spectrum shrinks. 
uh, particularly in our preferred uh, UHF band. Uh, anything we can do to uh, allow more simultaneous uh, frequencies in the same amount of spectrum or decreasing spectrum is uh, a worthy goal. So digital systems uh, go a long way toward that, much better than any analog systems. Any sound quality advantage? Well, uh, at least I know, by it's, subje I know yeah. it's subjective, right? <laughs> by, by measurement and by subjective means as well, uh, many people would uh, call the digital transmission uh, signal uh, wider frequency response, flatter frequency response, uh, better signal-to-noise ratio. And these are measurable uh, quantities that uh, can be achieved with digital transmission schemes. And so uh, there are some audible advantages as well. Now, I'll, I'll put in a plug for the guitar players of the world who, uh, and I've had these conversations numerous times from guitar players who have used uh, new digital systems for their instruments. And while they uh, note, gee, it sounds much closer to my guitar cable, it doesn't sound like my analog wireless system that I've been using for the last 10 years and my tone is completely based on the behavior of the analog wireless system uh, because of its inherent little bits of compression and so forth. And so for those folks who are used to an analog path and its inherent behaviors, uh, the digital scheme may not be that attractive, uh, at least from an audio quality standpoint, because it, it's just a tad too clean in some cases for those applications. So, like, Wait, is that what I really sound like? <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> cool. Um, here's a question about antennas, and I think this is good because this also plays into the wireless topic. And, and actually, looking ahead, reading the question here, I know it's something we would talk a lot about. Talk about a lot here. It says I see many using log periodic antennas at Monitor World, directly next to a stage, pointed right at the artists, maybe 25 to 30 feet away. Is this a recommended practice? From what I have read, is that using half wave antennas would be recommended for something under 50 feet away, etc. Well, uh, this brings up the question of uh, high-gain antennas, when to use them and mm -hmm. when to abuse them. Right. There's always a much broader <laughs> question within the somewhat specific question that we get asked, right? So uh, high-gain antennas like log periodic types, so-called shark fins, paddles, whatever you want to call them, uh, are a, a directional antenna that uh, also has the property of having enhanced sensitivity or gain in the direction that you point that thing. So uh, it is a way to uh, increase the uh, sensitivity of a receiver uh, in some ways, and that can translate into greater distance. Uh, but they also have some value in their directivity because you can aim them at the desired uh, radio source and, to some extent, away from undesired radio sources. So you've got uh, these two... Uh, uh, properties of, of directional antennas that you can use to your advantage. Uh, the gentleman is correct in implying that it may not always be such a good idea to have a high-gain antenna close to a radio source because that can uh, create such a high received signal strength that it can overload the front end of a receiver. And if you overload radio receivers, uh, you can create problems uh, where the, you've got increased uh, intermodulation being produced in the receiver itself. You can desensitize the receiver, which uh, counterintuitively can make the receiver less sensitive if you hit it too hard. So you generally don't want to use high-gain antennas close to the radio source uh, if you can avoid it. And so when we see People at Monitor World with uh, high-gain antennas cranked all the way up, aimed at a guitar player who's 10 feet away, and he's running his pack at 100 milliwatts, and they've connected the antennas with some garden hose to the receiver. The overload light on the receiver is lit up uh, like a Christmas tree, and that is potentially causing unintended effects. And the desensitizing effect is one of them, and you get this... Uh, behavior where, oh, he's 
dropping out. I'm having some issues here. I need to increase the gain even more, which is going in the wrong direction. So uh, we usually don't recommend directional antennas until uh, the radio source might be 100 feet away or something like that. But uh, the directional characteristics of these antennas are useful. And so what we would uh, recommend, perhaps, is uh, a directional antenna, but operated at low gain. Uh, some have an, uh, amplifiers on them, uh, which can be switched to various gain settings. Some are just passive, in which case they might only have 5 or 6 dB of forward gain. But there are even some uh, that have uh, attenuation. So you can have a, a directional antenna that has uh, the ability to operate at a uh, an attenuated position where the forward gain of that antenna is uh, neutralized. It becomes the same forward gain as an omni, but it retains the directional characteristics. So I'm not overloading the receiver, but I am rejecting interfering signals from behind me and off to the side. So uh, it's important to uh, keep in mind antenna gain uh, we frankly run into more problems with too much antenna gain than not enough. Um, and because the effects are not intuitive, it's often confusing to the, uh, to the users when they get these weird behaviors, uh, which they attribute to not enough signal, and it's actually too much signal. And sometimes people get confused about RF gain and RF overload, thinking that that's going to be the same thing as audio overload, where you hear it as distortion. But when you overload things in the RF realm, you don't hear that distortion. It manifests itself as dropouts. That's often the case. So uh, things that you do in radio land do not necessarily have a direct effect on audio uh, performance. Uh, by the time you start hearing audio problems that are caused by radio problems, you're probably pretty far down the wrong path at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next up, I'd like to apologize for the user that we made feel old by, because <laughs> he grew up splicing tape. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was, I've, I've done that too. I know Tim has, so you're not alone. Uh, or uh, of an age. Uh, moving on. Uh, okay, oh, this is a good one. This is a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts. I am trying to send a line, stereo if possible, signal from a Carnival Float music truck sound system to another music truck about 150 feet behind with about 800 people in between. Uh, can you recommend a way to get this done, good, good quality sound from music truck to music truck wirelessly? Absolutely. Point-to-point uh, -point wireless? This is point-to-point -point wireless is our general oh, I think, I think we have a graphic to go explanation that for somewhere. that. Yeah. Uh, or point to multi-point in case it's going to multiple destinations. But this is a very, very common technique uh, that can be accomplished with a variety of uh, wireless systems. Uh, the object, as the gentleman points out, is I need to get high-quality audio from point A to point B, and I can't run wire. So we'll use radio. Uh, the concept is, is easy. I run my audio signal into a transmitter of some sort. I transmit it to some receiver, and back at the receiver, I extract the audio, and off it goes. Uh, the difficulty in using uh, a single type of system to do this has to do with uh, the audio levels uh, and power. Uh, I could accomplish this with an in-ear monitor system, uh, which is happy to take line-level audio into the transmit side, mono or stereo. Uh, but at the receive side, I'm faced with this little body pack receiver. Uh, and so to get the signal from that body pack receiver into a, another sound system or some other destination, I have to have some adapter cables. I need to break out this little eighth-inch mini phone jack to two signals for stereo. Uh, I've got a little antenna that's attached to it that doesn't lend itself to being remoted. A thing's running on a battery, and I want the thing to run all day. So that receive pack is somewhat limited. I can get around all those things with appropriate adapters and put the pack up in the air and make external power and so forth. Uh, but if I had a uh, wireless microphone receiver that could pick up the signal from one of these inner monitor transmitters, uh, I'd be done as far as the mechanics and connectors and so forth. So there are uh, 
several systems that can be used, a uh, combination of wireless mic receiver and an uh, intermonitor transmitter to accomplish this. Uh, a, a likely one here is uh, any of our uh, PSM 900 or PSM 1000 transmitters, AC powered line level remote antennas. You can do whatever you want with, with the antennas. You can bump the power up to 100 mils or so. And at the receive end, our UHFR uh, receivers are capable of picking up those inter-monitor transmitter signals directly. Uh, there's a slight uh, mode change that you put the PSM transmitter into, so-called point-to-point mode. And when you do that, it recharacterizes the uh, radio signal so that it appears to be like a wireless mic signal. And then the UHFR receiver can pick that up. You get line or mic level out of that receiver. You've got remote antennas. You've got AC power, all that good stuff. So that's kind of the elegant way to do it. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you can make modifications on the battery ends of these things. You could even use a wireless body pack transmitter to be the, the front end of a system like this and send the signal off to the uh, receiver. But getting line level audio into a body pack transmitter is somewhat problematic. You've got to make sure the, the levels on the inputs are not so that they overload the transmitter. And again, you may have some limitations with antennas you got battery power and so forth. But it, it can be done. The concept is very straightforward, and uh, we have customers who actually do this for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their main business is point-to-point -point wireless for parades and outdoor festivals. Uh, and it's done very commonly at outdoor concerts where you want to run audio to delay towers uh, and you can't run cable across the field. So this is a very... Uh, easy way to do this. We've got a lot of FAQs on our website that specifically address uh, various techniques of doing this. All right. So sticking with wireless, I told you, um, since we're on the topic, this actually, uh, again, a very specific question that I think ties into the larger topic of frequency coordination, which is, here, here's the specific question. What is the recommended spacing of third order intermod for analog? What is recommended for digital? And follow-up in coordination how destructed destructive is intermod in a receiver setup versus a transmitter so i think like using combiners on the psm side of things ah. um but backing <clears throat> up maybe for people who may not even be aware of what we're talking when we talk about third order intermods and what that is maybe we can start there and then kind of get into okay the more specifics you can there. put up that uh, intermod slide yeah let me get back to that uh it turns out that uh, most radio systems uh, have certain nonlinear circuitry elements uh, that are prone to creating uh, what we'll call distortion products when you mix multiple frequencies in these uh, circuits. The example that you're looking at on your screen there uh, shows a couple of transmitters uh, running uh, probably about one megahertz apart uh, and uh, on either side of the two transmit signals, this is a spectrum analyzer view, you see some all, uh, other vertical spikes that are progressively lower level as they go off to the left and right. And these uh, other spurs that you see are called intermodulation products. And the mechanism is that the signal from one transmitter gets picked up by the output stage of the nearby other transmitter, mixes in a nonlinear portion of that circuit, and generates some new radio frequencies, and it happens in both directions. So you get this symmetric uh, pattern of intermod uh, uh, spikes that are occurring on either side of the original transmitters. And these are legitimate radio transmissions. Uh, if I tuned a receiver to one of those things, it would light up and say, oh, there's, there's a radio signal. It would have audio on it uh, from a combination of the two original transmitters. To, to a lesser extent, <clears throat> This same behavior can occur in receivers. That is, what you're seeing on the screen here is intermod from two transmitters that are physically close to each other within uh, probably uh, a couple of feet of each other. But even if the transmitters are far apart, when these two signals arrive at a receiver, there's a possibility that intermods can be produced in the receiver. And that will specifically happen if you hit the receiver too hard. If you overload, the receiver, it'll start producing intermods in the receiver itself. Yep. 
It all ties together. <laughs> yes. So uh, the question is is a is a good one, which is, okay, I see these intermods, I see my original transmitters. If I'm going to slot in a new frequency here, how far away does it have to be, either from the original transmit frequency or these intermod frequencies, to avoid any sort of direct interference? Uh, can you bring up wireless workbench Certainly. on that thing? Yeah. Okay. Each uh, type of radio equipment has some uh, measure of, of something we'll call selectivity, and that's uh, in the receiver specifically. How narrowly can that receiver tune to the desired frequency and ignore nearby competing frequencies? So what Gino is bringing up here is some parameters. Why don't you give me a UHFR for starters? Uh, some parameters that we measure on radio equipment. Uh, this table is the uh, operating parameters for UHFR wireless as analyzed by our wireless workbench program. And you'll notice uh, the three columns in there uh, for uh, more robust uh, standard and more frequencies. There are three columns of parameters. The, the ones you want to look at uh, that are important here are the uh, channel spacing parameter, which in the case of UHFR shows a minimum channel spacing in standard mode of about 325 kilohertz. This is actually quite good. Uh, anything that's below 400 kilohertz uh, channel to channel spacing is pretty good. Um, and that means I can literally have two frequencies that are that close to each other and the receiver can successfully pick up either one without interference from the other. You, you can slide that maybe down to 300 kilohertz under the more frequencies uh, domain, or if you want to be a little bit uh, tougher on yourself, you can push it out to 350 kilohertz. But this is the actual transmitter to transmitter spacing. If you look down below, we're looking at channel, channel to intermod spacing. So this is specifically what you were asking here about right. third order intermod spacing. So you can see the, the various intermods. The third order ones are the closest in to the original transmitters and the next pair of fifth order, and so forth, seventh order, ninth order, and so forth. So the odd order intermod products are what show up in those descending uh, galleries of spikes on either side of the original transmitter. Uh, because the intermods are not as strong as the actual transmit frequencies, we typically allow you to get a little closer to an intermod uh, than to uh, an on-channel signal. So it suggests that under standard uh, compatibility requirements, 175 kilohertz is adequate spacing between your transmitter and a third-order intermod product. And uh, we don't suggest that you get much closer to that even on the more frequency side. But uh, because the higher-order intermods are farther away, uh, we essentially ignore them. So where you see zero spacings on the rest of those things, the system is basically going to ignore those higher order intermods. Uh, by contrast, if you bring up SLX, for example, my, my favorite counterexample of, <laughs> of everything, uh, SLX has a very different set of parameters. Note particularly the channel-to-channel -channel spacing for SLX is 1.1 megahertz. Uh, that is 1,100 kilohertz. That means the channel-to-channel -channel spacing has to be more than a megahertz apart, which clearly shows that the SLX is not as efficient uh, from a spectrum standpoint as UHFR. I can't get that many frequencies in the same space because they have to be more than a megahertz apart. And likewise, because the receiver is not very selective, uh, the channel to intermod spacings are greater than what I would see with UHFR, and we kind of have to be concerned about some of the higher order intermods as well. So uh, this is a, a very uh, precise example of the relative spacings that you need to keep between channels and between intermods, well, channels to intermods, uh, based on the quality of the receiver. All, all of this goes back to the selectivity of the receiver, the transmitters, basically nothing to do with it. But uh, these are the things that are going on under the hood when you're calculating compatible sets of frequencies, and you have to take these things into account so that you don't start trampling on your own stuff when you fire up a lot of systems in the same venue. 
there was a question that was asked this morning, which was basically like, it was phrased in a way that they said, you know, well, what are the steps when you're going to manually, you know, set the frequencies on your system? And I think what this helps kind of illustrate is that it's not, it's not really possible to do it manually. That's why we have these sorts of things built into wireless workbench because you need a computer program to calculate all this stuff out for you so that you know you're going to have a compatible set of frequencies. Yeah, and, and remember, these compatibility programs do not in any way decrease or avoid intermods. Uh, intermods are kind of a natural uh, phenomenon that occurs when I'm operating multiple radio systems in close proximity to each other. And the object isn't to minimize intermods here. It's to calculate them and work around them. Right. So the program calculates all the possible intermods that might occur and keeps picking new frequencies until it can find a set that satisfies all of these spacing requirements. Even though there may be massive amounts of intermods being produced, they are handled by the program so they don't create problems. And just to tie in one more thing back to the, the, the original question about digital, um, notice that when we look at the third order spacing on a ULXD system, it's 75 kilohertz, down from 175 on UHFR. And if we go back actually to the, to the slide here, again, you can see when you look at two ULXDs tuned to the same frequencies as what we saw on the other side here, the, the inner mods are, are so low that they're basically in the noise floor. And, and it's worth pointing out, uh, there's nothing magical about the digital transmission scheme. That is, this uh, lack of intermod production from the digital transmitters here uh, is not inherently due to the fact that it's digital. It's due to the fact that the output stages of uh, digital transmitters have to be extremely linear. Uh, compared to an analog transmitter. I, we mentioned earlier that these intermods occur in nonlinear parts of the circuitry, uh, but analog systems can have significant amounts of nonlinearity and still get excellent audio and performance, no trouble. But uh, digital transmission requires extremely linear circuitry, both in the transmitter and receive side, and one of the positive uh, benefits of having linear circuitry in the transmitters is very low intermod production between digital transmitters. Uh, and this is the principal reason why digital systems have more uh, spectral efficiencies because they inherently produce very, very low levels of intermod uh, if they're properly designed. Okay, uh, let's change gears here then. So we've talked about wireless for a good half the webinar here. Let's go somewhere else. Let's go, how about headphones? Oh, boy. There's a question that was submitted in advance, and this is another one. I'm going to read the question, and then I'm going to paraphrase because I think there's a way we can make it a little bit more generic for people. The question is, as written, is I've been struggling trying to figure out what's best to buy for music recording or mastering as far as characteristics needed for an affordable and durable pair of headphones. How about things like changeable cables, ability to transform into balanced cables, comfort and sound quality? What would be the best impedance when one has a, already has a decent headphone amp to use? Now, let me, let me paraphrase that because we do get a lot of questions about headphones. And taking sound quality out of it, which is largely subjective, and we could tell you our headphones sound the best, but, I mean, every <laughs> headphone manufacturer is going to tell you that, right? So, and sound quality is somewhat subjective. I mean, it's hard for us to say what to look for there other than, does it sound like what you want it to sound like? Plus, it's difficult to measure a headphone and earphone response in a uh, meaningful way because the interaction of the headphones with your particular ear canal shape uh, is different for each uh, head that you stick the headphones right. on. Right. Looking at a frequency response graph of a headphone isn't usually very instructive. You really do have to listen to it. But we do have an FAQ, and what I'm getting around here, that you could also look at, but I think what we really want is, which is about understanding headphone and earphone specifications, but that's, I guess, the question, as I would phrase it, is what's, what, what really is important when you're looking at headphones? As far as specifications goes, what are the things that you might take into consideration? Well, uh, maybe starting with impedance, possibly. Yeah, I impedance is not uh, typically that big an issue. Uh, in modern uh, amplifier technology, the expectation is that any amplifier has a low output impedance, and the load impedance of whatever you plug into it, loudspeakers or headphones or what have you, 
uh, is going to be uh, higher than the source impedance of that amplifier. And that's a, uh, a good um, objective because if the source impedance is very low compared to the load impedance, then you'll get uh, good uh, power transfer and uh, minimal amounts of interaction between the load and the amplifier itself. Uh, so if you've got uh, headphones that are being driven by a, an amplifier that has uh, a power supply other than a battery, then that amplifier should be able to deliver enough power to those headphones that the actual impedance of the headphones is not going to be critical. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen headphones lower than maybe eight or eight ohms or so, uh, but the output amplifiers that we're talking about typically have output impedances much less than one ohm, so you still have a favorable uh, ratio there. So the absolute impedance of the headphones uh, for an amplifier that's not battery driven should not be critical. It may have an effect on sensitivity, that is with a given amount of output voltage uh, headphones of one impedance may be louder than headphones of another impedance, but as long as the amplifier has enough soup to drive those things, shouldn't be an issue. If it's a battery-powered amplifier, uh, things are a little different because uh, delivering a lot of power from a battery-powered thing uh, means that I may run out of soup. Uh, and low-sensitivity headphones driven by battery-powered things like in-ear monitor receivers uh, can either uh, run out of gas before they get as loud as you might need them to be, or they drain the battery so quickly that you don't get long operating times. Uh, so sensitivity is probably one of the numbers that you want to look at. For a given power, what's the output level, the acoustic sound pressure level of those uh, headphones? A high-sensitivity headphone means I don't need as much power to get the thing loud, <clears throat> and so uh, it may be a better match to some headphone amp that doesn't have a lot of soup. Uh, but uh, absolute impedance shouldn't be an issue. Um, th th that may come up if you're <clears throat> excuse me, paralleling a bunch of headphones in the studio. You've got four sets of headphones plugged into the same amplifier output. Then those load impedances... Uh, add up, you know, in a parallel form, you get a low overall load, and uh, that could be an issue in some case. But single amp to single headphones, pin should not be an issue. Sensitivity is important. It's how loud it gets, yeah. basically. How right? loud it gets for a given amount of soup. Right. Otherwise, it's go somewhere where you can audition them and find what seems to fit what yeah. you need. And yeah, and there was a mention in the question about balanced versus... Yeah, it's something being, being able to change over to balanced cables. <clears throat> the uh, the drivers in a headphone, like the elements in a dynamic microphone, are inherently a balanced thing. You've got a it's a little loudspeaker with a voice coil on it, and it has two wires attached to that voice coil. Uh, and if I drive that from an amplifier, I'm inherently driving a, a balanced signal. Now, when it's wired up, uh, we combine the ground sides of those two headphones. So you end up with a three-wire connection, if you will, where the ground is shared between the two headphone uh, drivers, and then you've got a, a hot side to each headphone. But uh, you could still argue that those signals are balanced signals. Uh, it's not really an unbalanced signal. So I'm not sure exactly where the question's going there, but uh, combining the grounds doesn't uh, inherently unbalance those signals. Okay, great. Uh, let's uh, let's let's take a wired mic question here too. Now, kind of mixing it up a little bit here. This is asks about one microphone and turns into another discussion. Why have there been no vocal microphones? And I don't know that that's necessarily true. But why have there been no vocal microphones with flat frequency response since the SM59? Some of you may remember that one. Why would I want some engineer to decide what the vocalist I am miking should sound like? No slight against engineers, no, really. If a given performer needs some help in articula articulation, then I'll give it to them. Thoughts on that? Well, yes. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, philosophy of trying to start with everything uh, as flat as possible. 
and add uh, equalization as required. Uh, and that is possible to some extent with condenser microphones. And I, I think the question here really relates to dynamic microphones, yeah. flat response dynamic microphones. That's the SM59. Right. So condenser microphones have always been uh, prized for their inherently wide and flat frequency responses and the ability to EQ them as you wish uh, because they perhaps don't have much of a characteristic sound. Although many vintage microphone admirers uh, spend many hours discussing the particular sound qualities of microphones that are supposed to be flat. In any event, uh, dynamic microphones are much trickier a device to make a flat frequency response. Uh, and uh, in most cases, uh, it has become somewhat uh, uh, expected that dynamic microphones will have certain uh, frequency response characteristics that have become uh, expected for uh, close-up vocals and so forth. The little presence peak, little low-frequency roll-off here, some proximity effect and so forth. And yes, you end up with a whole bunch of microphones that have similar frequency responses, none of which are flat. Uh, but over the years, manufacturers have attempted to make dynamic microphones that have flat frequency response. Uh, the SM59 that was part of the original question was such a microphone. Uh, very flat response, although not very extended high frequency response, but flat through its uh, main uh, range uh, with uh, minimal proximity effect. Um, but that microphone had uh, a, a severe uh, lack of output. Uh, if you looked at the sensitivity of the SM59 specifically, uh, it was probably 6 dB less than any of our other standard dynamics because you can trade off sensitivity for flatter frequency response. The SM7 is a good example of that. Uh, that microphone uh, has a pretty flat response when you take out the, the presence peak, uh, but the output level of it is quite low compared to some of our other microphones, and so it requires pretty good preamp to get that thing up uh, to a usable level. And the SM59 was a similar thing. Uh, so is it possible to have a flatter response microphone that controls proximity effect uh, and so forth and still has reasonable output? Uh, with the advent of uh, neodymium magnets, the sensitivity issue uh, can generally be dealt with. Uh, and one recent development I'll mention here is the Assure KSM-8, uh, called the dual dyne. <laughs> what does that mean? Well. One of the uh, things that tends to make a dynamic microphone kind of peaky uh, and not flat is it has a single diaphragm which has some built-in resonant frequency uh, which has to be um, uh, damped uh, in order to uh, get some sort of flat frequency response out of the microphone. And the more you damp it, the wider the flat range becomes, but the lower the overall output becomes. Uh, at the same time, dynamic microphones, directional dynamic microphones, have a pretty strong proximity effect, which is the low frequency boost that you get when you're very close to the microphone. Uh, and that tends to be uh, very uh, much concentrated at one particular frequency, typically around 100, 120 hertz or so, uh, and can be quite exaggerated when you really put your foot in it. Uh, so uh, you don't want to go to an omni microphone because then you lose all your directional characteristic and you lose the proximity effect. So is there a way to make uh, a dynamic microphone with uh, a more controlled proximity effect? And yes, there is. Uh, and we borrow the idea from the condenser microphones. There are numerous condenser microphone elements out there that are dual diaphragm types. Uh, KSM 84 or 44 would be an example. Uh, you know, Neumann U87s, things like that. Uh, they have two diaphragms back to back, but with a condenser, those diaphragm sections can sort of be turned on and off, uh, so you have multiple patterns available. But even when that rear diaphragm is, is off, that is not electrically contributing, 
it's still part of the acoustic network, the acoustic circuit of the microphone, and it has an effect on the overall acoustic behavior of the, of the microphone. And the KSM-8 dual dyne is a dual diaphragm dynamic microphone. Uh, we believe the first successful implementation of this. Uh, and it has the same effects in a dynamic uh, element as it would in a condenser element, which is uh, for proximity effect, it spreads out the frequency range where proximity effect occurs rather than being at a specific uh, frequency because the diaphragms have different resonances uh, and also uh, makes it less uh, pronounced. Uh, so when you're working a dual diaphragm microphone uh, like this, you can change your distance uh, to the microphone over a, a wider uh, range without uh, triggering a really pronounced single frequency proximity effect. And so you end up with a microphone that has a much more controlled uh, proximity effect and you can work the microphone uh, to a greater extent uh, as a singer. Uh, and it's not as peaky either in the, uh, the upper part of the range as some of our more traditional vocal microphone. So, yes, there have been some developments. Uh, this is a, a new thing. Uh, but if you really need the flattest response of things, ultimately it will not be a dynamic microphone. You're going to have to go to a condenser which has the physics on its side <laughs> uh, to make a flat response thing. Okay. Here, now, here's a great question. What is the event? Not that the others haven't been good, but this one is, <laughs> this is, this will be a good one. What is the effect of age on audio frequency devices, microphones or headphones? In other words, all else being equal, would a new, let's say, SM58 perform appreciably better than a 10-year-old SM58 or a 20-year-old SM58? If I plugged in an otherwise highly high-quality classic mic like an RCA DX77, would age alone degrade the audio product of that device? Uh, in general, no. <laughs> For passive transducer microphones. Uh, that is, things that don't have active circuitry in them. Uh, so dynamic microphones, uh, ribbon microphones, uh, these things don't really show uh, significant age-related effects uh, with frequency response. Uh, in the For whatever it's worth department, we have uh, what we call shelf aging units here at Shure for almost every microphone that we've made and certainly the ones that are still in production, which means we have SM57s and SM58s and 545s and things like that that go back uh, to the early to mid-1960s. And periodically, we drag these things off the shelf, throw them in the uh, anechoic chamber, and run them and we compare them to current product. And basically, the current product has to be like the original stuff or the current product isn't right. Mm -hmm. And because we have decades of measurements on some of these microphones, we can uh, truthfully uh, say that the overall response of these things uh, does not uh, change appreciably just by having the thing sit there. Now, a good question would be, well, I'm singing into this thing every night. I've got it in front of my kick drum. I'm doing nasty things to it. Is that going to affect uh, the behavior of the microphone in the long run? Aside from failures of glue or voice coil windings or mechanical issues like that, the mere uh, flexing of the uh, voice coil wires or the uh, mylar diaphragms of these things uh, does not create any sort of fatigue issues with those materials. Uh, the displacements that you would actually look at on, on the moving parts of a microphone are, are microns. They're very, very small deflections of these uh, moving parts, the diaphragms. And so you don't really get fatigue effects on these things. So uh, 
I would not expect the absolute frequency response of these things to change appreciably over time. However, the grills, <laughs> particularly vocal grills microphones, the grills will, how shall we say, accumulate stuff. Oh, there's that too. <laughs> and if the grills are accumulating stuff, uh, that's going to change the sonic character of the microphone. Or if the foam in the grill is deteriorating, which they do, that can change the acoustic character of the thing. But uh, as far as the basic engine, they, they don't really have uh, measurable uh, changes over time, as long as you don't exceed the elastic limits on the moving parts. They really kind of work until they don't, is what I yeah. uh, tell you know, there'll be an if it breaks, there's an obvious like, oh, that's distorted, or it just rattling is, or something, rattling or crackling or something like that. But yeah. there's never like a gradual, like say, loss of high frequency response that you may not notice until you compare it to an old one, and then said, oh, wow, this is different. Like that doesn't yeah. really. But when you hear that thing, it's that sort of difference is probably accumulation in the grill mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. than anything else. Yep. Uh, but you know, microphones that have electronic components, condensers, those can suffer a variety of ills as the electronic uh, components of those circuits may uh, change with age. So capacitors uh, can dry out if they're electrolytics or uh, there are things that can change with the active circuitry microphones. All right, so let's. Uh, I think we got time for one more here. We're going to go back to jump back to wireless for a second. This is this is a good one because I think you've done some experiments in this area. Is it plausible to decrease the noise floor for a noisy environment such as video walls with attenuators? So we're talking about RF noise, right? With attenuators while boosting transmitters to high power to compensate, ultimately giving you more dynamic range in a high noise floor environment. Video walls, huh? Yes. <laughs> LED video walls, my favorite thing. Not. Uh, We've had uh, a lot of run-ins with LED video walls over the last few years, and it's getting a lot worse. Uh, these are uh, producers of wideband significant RF noise, which can raise the overall noise floor on a stage by 10, 15, maybe 20 dB uh, above background uh, if it's not a well-designed thing. So how do you get around this with wireless systems? The technique that the person proposes here, oh, and this is a good example. Uh, this was all that trash, the green trash at the bottom is all from the uh, LED video wall, which is only about probably 15 feet behind the backline instruments. So how do you deal with that? Yes, uh, a good idea, it, it, to the extent that you can still get your frequencies coordinated, frequencies coordinated, is to boost the power of the transmitter. Of, which increases the signal-to-noise ratio above the uh, RF noise floor. Uh, that's perfectly good, as long as you're not overloading your receivers. Another extremely useful technique is to go back to our directional antenna. The directional antenna, uh, log periodic type, is kind of like a cardioid microphone. It's more sensitive in the front, uh, and it's much less sensitive in the rear, it's not like a laser pointer. It's probably about 120 degree coverage angle. So if your pickup antennas are faced away from the video wall, like they're behind the performers, for example, and faced out toward the audience, that uh, dramatically improves the signal to noise ratio of the signal that's coming in from the front of the antenna versus the junk that's coming in the backside. So uh, we greatly encourage people to use directional antennas to point them away from these uh, high RF noise sources. Uh, but bumping the transmitter power is, is certainly a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but it, uh, you're Maybe mentioned, not across the board. Though. Not across <laughs> the board, perhaps. Uh, you know, when Keith is going down the runway, he should be running at 100 milliwatts. Uh, and I suppose if you have an Axiom transmitter, you can just dial him down when he gets back on stage. But uh, I wouldn't bump the power on everything uh, as high as you can. Uh, and, but just be conscious of not overloading your receivers if you're bumping the power on the transmitters. Great. All right. Well, we're just about out of time here. Okay, we'll do one more quick one because this could be fast, right? Ready? What's the best mic for acoustic guitar recording? Go. Oh, <laughs> I like uh, KSM 137s. Oh, yeah, that, that is a good one. I do like those. Yeah. Flat response condenser microphone in general, KSM 137 to be specific. Yeah. 
Great. Okay. So uh, thanks, everyone, for submitting all those great questions. Um, and thanks to Tim for joining us and answering those questions. Um, I, obviously, we didn't get to everybody's, and I apologize for that. But you can always send an email to support at sure.com, and we will uh, make every attempt. Uh, in fact, I almost guarantee we will get an answer to your question if you send it there, because then time is time is unlimited. So that's support at sure.com, and someone can, can get back to you with an answer. Uh, also, we're going to be archiving this webinar and we'll probably archive the morning session too because there was a different set of questions. So you can always go back later and view that one and listen to it or review this one if in case you need a refresher or any of our other past webinars. They're all up there at sure.com slash training. And to sign up for notifications for future webinars, you can go to sure.com slash subscribe and you'll get an email the next time we're, we're doing one of these, which is about, about monthly. So thanks again for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.